In this edition of Global Print, I'm going to talk to you about BRICS, which is the five nation acronym for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. The first letter of each of these countries, B for Brazil, R for Russia, I for India, C for China, and S for South Africa, makes up this uh, five nation uh, grouping. And this is uh, a virtual summit that is being held on the 23rd of June virtually which means that Prime Minister Narendra Modi is going to share screen time with all the leaders of these five countries, which is Vladimir Putin of Russia, uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping, he is the host, of course, Cyril Ramaphosa, the President of South Africa, and uh, Yair Bolsonaro, who is the President of Brazil. Now, this is going to be an interesting summit, not only because Vladimir Putin, this is the first time that leaders are meeting Vladimir Putin, um, virtually, of course, since the invasion of Ukraine. But a lot has happened ever since. But before I go any further, dear viewer, I'd like to make an appeal to you. Please do subscribe, pay just a li little bit for the Prince, free, fair, objective and unhyphenated journalism. It's not very much money, only rupees 159, but I would urge you to subscribe so that you, you, will, you do get benefits as a subscriber that non-subscribers don't have. You have helped us through these last months um, and couple of years actually across the pandemic. So we do hope that you will continue to encourage us with your support. So click on the button, pay Rs. 159 and become a subscriber to the print. Now, it's interesting, of course, that the BRIC summit is being held virtually because the world is rapidly opening up. We saw how the Quad summit was held just a few weeks ago in Tokyo in Japan and Prime Minister Modi was there, of course, as you know, that the Quad is made up of four nations, which is the US, Japan, Australia and India. So in a sense, what is interesting is that India is common to both the Quad and the BRICS. So it's the one large country uh, that is common to both these groupings. Both these groupings, of course, are in a sense in direct competition with each other because China very much the largest economy in the BRICS grouping, but the second largest economy in the world after the US. So the Quad being very much uh, masterminded in a sense by the US. Of course, all the other countries are equal partners. But India, like I said, is common to both these groupings. So the Quad was held in person. So why, you might ask, was the BRICS um, held virtually? Now, one of the reasons, of course, is very clear, which is that uh, Chinese troops have encroached upon Indian territory, have held, have been holding Indian territory for the last two years. And there was absolutely no way that uh, an Indian prime minister could take that flight to Beijing and sit uh, across the same table with Xi Jinping, because it is his troops, PLA troops, that are encroaching upon India's side of the line of actual control. We know that 15 rounds have been held. Some uh, territory has been returned, meaning that the Chinese troops have gone back on their side of the line of actual control. But the conversations on some other patrolling points remain. So, um, you know, you might ask again, why is it that the Chinese did not work hard enough to have Narendra Modi, the prime minister, attend the BRICS summit? Because if you go back a little bit into history, in 2017, when Chinese troops were eyeball to eyeball with Indian troops in Doklam, which is in Bhutan, um, and uh, that's that was an interesting situation because it's the Chinese, because the Chinese ha had come right up to the border of Bhutan, uh, were very much in danger of um, of building a road which would give them strategic if not access, but at least uh, they would be in a position uh, which would sort of overlook the chicken's neck, which is the narrow strip of territory that connects uh, mainland India to the northeast. And uh, at the time, this was in July, August of 2017, the standoff lasted uh, over 70 days. Indian troops basically protecting Bhutanese territory and preventing the Chinese troops from cutting across and building that road uh, to, to gain access or to potentially gain strategic access to the uh, chicken stack area. So at the time, again, there was a BRICS summit that was going to be held in Xiamen in China. Um, the, uh, the Chinese government very much wanted 
all the BRICS nations leaders to attend, including the Prime Minister. And if you remember, dear viewer, negotiations between the Indian and the Chinese officials went on for days on end. At last, those were successful. Uh, the Chinese troops withdrew back to the positions that they had uh, that they had uh, started from, which means that they went back a few hundred yards. And uh, this gave Prime Minister, it allowed Prime Minister Narendra Modi to face, to save face and to take that uh, flight to Beijing. So you might want to ask, why is it that the Chinese didn't do this before? So clearly something is up and clearly the Chinese didn't work hard enough to have the Prime Minister uh, at the BRIC summit in Beijing. And since Prime Minister Modi was not going to attend, there was no way that you could have an in-person meeting with you know, everybody else attending and one leader not attending. So there it was, a virtual summit between these five leaders. The second point I'd like to make is that uh, the BRICS, which has always talked about upholding the principles of uh, territorial integrity of sovereignty, is actually violating its own principles. For example, the Russian president Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. It's been over 100 days. We know that the invasion took place on the 24th of February. So BRICS leaders violating their own principles. And let me read out to you what External Affairs Minister S. J. Shankar said to the BRICS foreign ministers only a month or so ago in May. And he said that BRICS has repeatedly affirmed respect for sovereign equality, territorial integrity and international law. We must live up to these uh, commitments. Uh, again, National Security Advisor Ajit Doval, who uh, just had a meeting of the National Security Advisors of all the BRICS nations. Incidentally, that meeting took place on the second anniversary of the Galwan clash in Ladakh, in which 20 soldiers very unfortunately lost their lives. Now, you might want to ask, so if all this is going on, um, if, in, if Chinese troops are sitting on Indian territory, why is it that Prime Minister Narendra Modi is still participating in the BRIC summits? In fact, why is it that External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar, while pointing towards the fact that BRICS is violating its own principles, still continues to uh, participate in those meetings? And the answer to that is very, very simple. The answer is that India's foreign policy, India has adopted a realistic mode of foreign policy, which means that it's not going to lean left or right. It's going to be very much in the center, a swing state. And the definition of a swing state is that you move in the direction in which you can best uphold your own national interest. So, you know, it's a, it's, it sounds very simple, but actually, if you look at it in terms of real politic or high diplomacy, it gets more complicated than that, of course. Uh, so you have, on the one hand, the Quad, in which Prime Minister Modi very much participated. On the other hand, you have the BRICS. And later this month, at the end of the month, uh, the Prime Minister will be going to Germany to participate in the G20 summit. Again, a collection of the 20 biggest economies in the world, and India one of them. So India not sitting on the high moral ground, not spouting big, big words, but keeping its head down, holding its nose, and doing what it believes to be in its own national interest. Let me give you an example of that. And the, the best example that I can find today is that India continues to buy oil from Russia. Now, a lot of the Western economies uh, have, which have imposed sanctions on Russia since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. This includes sanctioning uh, energy products while some countries, especially Germany, continues to buy uh, both oil and natural gas from uh, Russia. A lot of the other countries are tapering down their purchases, although I've just read recently that Switzerland, for the first time since the invasion, has restarted the purchase of Russian gold. So I suppose that's what the Russians are banking on, which is that they are going to earn um, foreign exchange, very welcome foreign exchange in exchange uh, for the uh, sale of their resources, which is both energy and gold in this case with Switzerland. So to come back to what India is doing. Now, India has decided to purchase uh, both oil and coal from Russia. Um, 
we know we, if you remember a couple of months ago, the Americans got a bit upset about that and a couple and senior officials in the U.S. administration made comments about India's purchase of uh, Russian energy. But if you if you think about it carefully, and here it is, is that India's economy, which is you know just coming off the pandemic, lurching from crisis to crisis, doesn't want to destabilize the lives of its own people. India imports more than 80% of its energy needs from abroad. Um, but if you, if you look at it, oh, as a lot of the energy producing countries have been sanctioned, whether it's Venezuela or Iran and now Russia. So where do countries like India buy their energy from? How do you keep the wheels of the economy um, rotating so that you're able to assure a modicum of a comfort or a, a mean standard of living to your own people. And that will only come if you have a ready and consistent supply of energy. So enter Russia. So this realism that is driving Indian foreign policy is actually quite interesting. Um, so the Modi government refusing to take any sides, refusing to criticize Vladimir Putin on the invasion of Ukraine, although it has talked about uh, the, the human humanitarian needs of the, of the Ukrainian people, very much participated in the Quad, in the G20, also participating in the BRICS. And that is why this realism that is driving India's foreign policy is, is you can see it alive and well as uh, Indian leaders participate in groupings which are otherwise seemingly uh, contradictory to each other, but India very much uh, a participant in, in all of these. In my column, Global Print, on the Print's website, which I would urge you to need, in fact, I have tagged a Reuters report which says that Indian importers are lapping up Russian coal, oil, and other energy products. If you read that piece, you will, uh, you will be able to go to the hyperlink, which is to the Reuters piece, and there you can get some information or some data on what exactly Indian um, importers are doing with Russian energy. Another point that I'd like to make is that this new realism that drives India's foreign policy. Now, clearly, Indian leaders believe, Prime Minister Modi uh, and External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar, that it's better to be part of these high tables than to be out of them. If you're going to take this very high moral ground, then you can say, hey, I don't like this uh, about the Chinese or about the Russians or the Brazilians or about the Australians or the Americans. But you're refusing to criticize anybody because you very much want to be part of the high table that these groupings offer. So much better to be inside the Lakshman Rekha than outside it. I think that's the uh, mantra that's driving the Modi government. Remember that BRICS is actually turning out to be quite an interesting grouping too. Although it gets bad press, uh, in, especially in the Western Hemisphere. And that's because, of course, you have a Russian president. Putin and both the, the Chinese president as well. But there are a couple of very interesting things happening in BRICS as well. The first is that the Chinese are very keen, and as are the Russians, to expand the BRICS um, grouping. So right now, like I said, you have these five countries, but now the uh, Chinese and the Russians are both talking about how Saudi Arabia as well as Argentina very much want to become part of BRICS. That's interesting because we know that the Saudis are very close to the Americans and Argentina, well, not as much. So interesting that these two countries want to become part of BRICS. Then you have the BRICS Plus initiative. And what that is, is that at the BRICS foreign ministers meeting in May, in fact, which was accompanied by a dialogue with emerging markets and developing countries, and the foreign ministers of the following countries attended Kazakhstan, Saudi Arabia, Argentina, Egypt, Nigeria, Senegal, the UAE and Thailand. Now, that's quite a diverse uh, number of uh, countries. If all of them want to become part or at least want to be uh, observers, if you like, or in time, they want to become members of the BRICS grouping, you would wonder why. Clearly, the answer is that China, which is driving the world's economy in more ways than one, these countries want to feed off that huge engine that China is. Remember that also there is um, 
the BRICS Bank, or which is all what is called the New Development Bank. And only in December 2021, Egypt became the fourth member of the BRICS Bank, along with, uh, and just a couple of months before that, UAE, Senegal, and Bangladesh had become members of this New Development Bank or the BRICS Bank. So clearly, these countries um, keen to be able to take loans or hopefully softer loans at better interest rates than you would get in the open market. And uh, it seems like the BRICS Bank has disbursed $30 billion in 80 projects to all its member countries. So there we have it, a new realism that rules India, India's foreign policy. India very much wants to be part of all the uh, international organizations, not just them, but the groupings, the, the private groupings that people set up. So a large country like India with a growing market, uh, currently, of course, the economy is, um, is a bit up and down, but the world recognizes that India's moment is coming or is yet to come. So nobody wants to ignore a large country like India, the only other Asian power uh, that rivals China. Uh, thank you so much for watching my video and like I said, I do encourage you to read my column Global Print on the Print's website and I hope you will send me suggestions for what to do for my next um, Global Print column. Thank you so much.